My name is Liam Burrow and I'm the uh, lucky naturalist that gets to chat you through a couple of Africa's finest waterside um, and other scenes over the next two hours or so. But uh, before we get too carried away with things here at uh, Victoria Falls Safari Lodge, um, I'd like to remind you that we do, um, we do try to keep these shows as interactive as possible. So please keep your questions, comments, thoughts uh, coming to us throughout the show. Director Chulu and uh, myself will be uh, standing by uh, waiting to hear from you. So yeah, keep those uh, questions coming. But a pretty serene looking day here at um, uh, Vic Falls Safari Lodge in uh, Zimbabwe um, at the Vulture Restaurant. Uh, looks pretty relaxed. I don't think there's too much uh, food left on the ground. Looks like the majority of these uh, vultures and marabou stalks have done their feeding. Time now to just uh, do a bit of relaxation and a bit of uh, sunbathing by the looks of that guy in the back with his uh, wings spread open and as they digest and uh, carry on with their days. I mentioned in an earlier segment how critical these uh, vulture restaurants um, actually are in the um, conservation process of, um, of the vulture populations in southern Africa. Our vultures, after all, are uh, under pretty severe threat in a lot of areas, um, in particular from things like poisoning. So unfortunately, there is uh, quite a large illicit trade in uh, vulture body parts and um, uh, those body parts are in demand from South Africa's or Southern Africa's traditional medicine um, industry and you are unfortunately as a result uh, carcasses are very often poisoned in some areas the vultures fly in from uh, hundreds of kilometers around feed on something like a, a poison laced cow carcass and then die in enormous numbers. And then those bodies can be picked up, uh, the wings are chopped off, I believe the feet and the heads are used as well. Um, yeah, and uh, the ecosystem suffers greatly as a result. So any opportunity to uh, feed vultures and encourage them to stay in these uh, wilderness areas, the protected areas, are a very, very good initiative. So uh, long may this last at uh, Vic Falls Safari Lodge. Still quite a few vultures coming in. I think they're, um, they're spotting the amount of vultures on the ground um, as they're sort of uh, soaring around thousands of feet above and they're coming in presuming that there's something dead here. Um, I don't know, perhaps I got it wrong. Maybe they're about to put some feed down. Uh, we'll have to see how it goes. But always, uh, always a very exciting thing to see vultures in these kind of numbers. Now I mentioned uh, that they fly at some pretty impressive heights. Uh, now the highest vulture ever recorded uh, was a Rupel's vulture. And a species found uh, further up towards the equator into places like uh, Old Donio, you'll find them. And that vulture was recorded at 37,000 feet. And now it's not known uh, whether that was just uh, sort of an unusual one-off, um, or if vultures very commonly uh, spend, uh, spend time at heights uh, that high off the ground. That 37,000 feet is an impressive feat regardless. That is like uh, cruising altitude for uh, big jets. I was right. Here comes the guy with uh, <laughs> with some some meat for our vultures. How extraordinary is that? Cheapers. Oh my goodness! Talk about an absolute swarm of vultures. Chaos. Now each vulture can eat a couple of kilograms in a single sitting, so um, there certainly isn't enough uh, to give everybody a significant feed. 
and hence all of this chaos. Yeah, but a wonderful bonus for um, the birds that do manage to get something. Now, once again, those very tall birds that are quite clearly not vultures are marabou stalks, a species of stalk that specializes in uh, feeding on carrion, feeding on dead meat. Now, that's not all marabou stalks eat. They'll also take uh, insects, uh, little crocodiles, frogs, that sort of thing. And they love a good fish. That uh, meat is their specialty. And much like the vultures, they are uh, an essential element of uh, the natural world's cleanup crew. In the absence of these sort of uh, uh, scavenging birds, if you want to call them that, um, the bush is, uh, is much more at risk of uh, experiencing outbreaks of diseases such as anthrax, uh, things that can be fatal for uh, large, uh, large groups of animals at a time. So while they may not be the, um, the most attractive, the most uh, photogenic looking animals, vultures and storks, and they are very, very useful indeed. Hello Victoria, I'm looking forward to spending the afternoon with you as well. Nice to have you on board. And hello to Joan Mello, and indeed the man right on schedule. Um, incredible that these vultures were um, were arriving even before uh, the food arrived. This must be a, a fairly regular thing at this time. Casper says, uh, vulture feeding, what a wonderful daily event. Totally. Yeah, always a, a, real, a real privilege and a bit of excitement to see such a volume of them. And while I'm not getting the audio, I'm sure the... Um, the audio for all of you at home was uh, pretty chaotic and they make some incredible vocalizations when they are uh, kind of squabbling over food. And um, yeah, I guess uh, you, you don't really get a great idea of scale with, uh, with these vultures at quite a distance. But they are immense birds and the white back which is the bigger of the two vulture species here and can have a six foot wingspan they get up to i think between five and seven kilos so we're talking like frozen turkey size they are huge birds yeah and uh, i'm of the opinion that they're actually quite magnificent Certainly they, uh, they deal with pretty dirty things, but they're not, uh, not particularly dirty birds. And they also bath very regularly, uh, possibly multiple times a day. And certainly they, they do go and have a, have a bit of a clean after they've uh, had some food. Uh, Debbie has asked, how long have they been running this vulture restaurant for? Debbie, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, I know it's been on this uh, Live at the Waterhole show for quite a while, uh, but I would think it was running long before that. And certainly seeing kind of all of this disturbed, compacted soil around here, now that tells me that uh, this activity has been ongoing. A very regular spot. Now there are a couple of these vulture restaurants as they're called around. Um, are one or two in the Limpopo region of South Africa. And it is uh, quite realistic that uh, vultures from this particular site uh, could even travel to that one a couple of thousand kilometers south in South Africa. Lady Macbeth um, has thankfully given us some clarification there. She says they've been doing uh, doing this for 15 years. And hello to you as well, Lady Macbeth. Thank you. So 15 years it is. Uh, wonderful that there are people out there um, taking this um, uh, this vulture problem seriously. Taxi Lady has hit the nail right on the head. 
she says, this proves that the vultures have a sense of time as they were there before the food. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we must give uh, give animals more credit. Uh, they certainly uh, certainly show a quite a capacity for intelligence, and certainly they can learn something like a feeding schedule down to the minute. I wonder if these guys are not hanging around in the hopes of a, a second round of, uh, of entrees there. Can't blame them. But yeah, we'll see see what happens. And now these vultures do quite a bit of their digestion on the wing. Uh, but a vulture's digestive system cannot process a lot of the fragments of bone, occasionally entire whole bones, um, horns, hooves, um, etc. that they do consume when they're taking down gulps and gulps of meat at a time. So uh, as that, um, that meat is sort of all digested off of whatever they've, uh, they've swallowed, um, they must regurgitate the bones, which they occasionally do from a pretty dizzying heights. Um, I was actually guiding on a little reserve outside Hoodsprate, um, doing a little bit of bush maintenance in the middle of the day between safaris uh, with one of my field guide uh, naturalist colleagues. And um, yeah, the two of us were um, uh, clearing some bush, stood out in uh, quite an open area, uh, packing some 
attacking some erosion, trying to do a bit of habitat maintenance. And um, my colleague next to me sort of shouted out in pain and looked at me. Um, and I sort of said, well, what, what happened? And um, he had a cut on the top of his head and there was quite a large, sharp bone uh, sat on the ground next to him. And I think for a second, he thought I had thrown it at him, but it uh, could only have come from a vulture soaring so high above us, it was even out of sight. <laughs> Unreal, what are the chances? But uh, anyway, certainly an application of uh, something like betadine to, to the wound on the top of his head, considering all the bacteria uh, that must have been in that vulture's gut. And, and he was left with a pretty interesting story to tell. That might even be up. That's a pair of white back vultures mating there in the center of the frame. That's something I've never seen before. Now, Shiv has asked, are the blue backed birds a type of stork? Uh, yes, they are, Shiv. They are marabou storks. Uh, regarded as one of the ugliest birds on the planet. If you've never seen one up close, uh, Google it. Uh, Marabou. M-R-A-B-O-U. Yeah, they're certainly pretty, uh, they're pretty unusual looking. I don't think they're hideous, but uh, they're not, uh, not pretty by any means. And these hooded vultures, the ones in the frame at the moment, with the very skinny bills, are sort of lowest in the pecking order. So they are uh, just coming in now that all of the bigger guys have moved off. I think in the hopes of picking up little tiny fragments and scraps, uh, which may have been left behind in all the chaos. Uh, Lady Macbeth says the Drakensberg Vulture Restaurant has an arrangement with local farms. Uh, she doesn't know about here. Uh, quite right, Lady um, Lady Macbeth. Yeah, it's a pretty efficient way on uh, sort of all of the local farms and around the Vulture Restaurant we're talking about uh, here in South Africa. Obviously to deal with uh, dead livestock that would otherwise be, um, uh, be needing to be sort of incinerated or buried. Uh, quite a wasteful. And when you consider how uh, valuable it is as a source of food to these vultures. Now they also are uh, enormously resilient to uh, diseases. So even things as serious as, as anthrax don't kill, uh, kill the vultures. So the uh, quality of the meat is not really too much of a concern. Alrighty, well with things uh, kind of quietening down here at Vic Falls, I think it's time to check in at another one of our uh, live waterhole locations. So let's head a bit further south into South Africa to Tau Lodge. So back over here at uh, Madikwe, uh, specifically Tau Lodge, right up on the uh, boundary with Botswana to the north. A pretty sleepy scene by the waterside. I can see a couple of crocodiles just on the bank, sort of on the right hand side of the screen there. At least two. It looks like uh, it could be quite overcast at uh, Tau today. So in terms of basking, these crocodiles have uh, their work cut out for them uh, to some degree. It's a bit tricky getting their uh, energy requirements met for today.
and that's all three crocodiles set together quite nicely. Amazing uh, viewing them from kind of back and behind. Uh, you can see just how fat and healthy uh, certainly the two on the left and right, but I'd say the one in the middle as well. Now these uh, these crocs are not struggling by any means. And uh, as I mentioned a couple of times before on this uh, Live at the Waterhole uh, program, a crocodile in a condition, a physical condition as good as these three are, um, is in a very, very good position indeed. Should hard times fall on them, uh, they have the ability to, um, to last a serious stretch of time. I've heard as much as two years without food. Uh, Shiv says, oh, you are not kidding. Just Googled the marabou stalk, a face only a mother could love. <laughs> a true story, Shiv. Yeah, they're certainly not pretty. But if you think about it, a bit like a vulture with those marabous uh, sticking their heads into carcasses and whatnot, it pays for them to be a bit, um, a bit bolder on top, uh, rather than having feathers getting all sticky and caked with our blood and bodily fluids and that sort of stuff. So they are uh, uh, efficient off. We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content.
Uh, Danny has asked, why is that one sitting with its mouth open? Uh, Danny, quite simply, it probably comes down to thermoregulation. So as these crocodiles uh, sit in the sun, their body temperature uh, rises quite rapidly. And um, eventually they get to a point where they're starting to, to kind of overheat. And they will open that mouth to radiate a bit of extra heat. And if it gets completely un unmanageable, uh, they will return to the water. As Spas asks, how big are the crocs at Tau in comparison with the crocs in other locations? Um, Spas, these guys, I reckon, are probably around the three to three and a half meter mark. So uh, nine, ten foot, somewhere around there. Not enormous. Um, certainly one of the crocodiles that we see at uh, Chitra Dam on Juma is uh, much bigger, maybe four meters. But yeah, I guess uh, I guess it's all relative uh, when it's uh, latched onto one of your legs. <laughs> um, the difference between uh, three meters and four meters is fairly inconsequential. Yeah, I've always had uh, quite a large respect for crocodiles, and they have the potential to do enormous damage. And uh, the fact that one could be lurking in uh, water only uh, a foot and a half or so deep, right at your feet, yeah, it's uh, certainly led me to be quite cautious around the water's edge uh, throughout my upbringing in Africa. And as quite a keen fisherman, I'm always, um, always very, very alert as to the presence of crocs as well. Definitely good to good to be seeing these crocs and nice to be seeing them all together, Joan. Yeah, you uh, you may not think of them as uh, particularly sociable animals, but uh, they certainly have a social side. And so seeing them uh, seeing them all sort of basking in the same place together. Is not particularly unusual. I've been fortunate on a couple of occasions to witness crocodile courtship in the wild, and um, it's a behaviour that I would describe as as tender, as something that you uh, may not attribute to a crocodile in terms of its characteristics. Uh, certainly the way they feed and the way they fight uh, might lead you to think they're pretty brutal and I guess they do have that side to them but uh, when crocodiles mate and um, again I witnessed this in person uh, twice in the, the western sector of the Sabi Sands uh, the male crocodile uh, in quite deep water swam up alongside uh, the female kind of brushed his face along hers very very gently on both sides uh, blowing bubbles underwater the entire time and sort of gently tapping her with um, sort of the very end of his nose and then uh, mating quite fascinatingly takes place in the water as well and then uh, following that a few short weeks later probably two or three weeks that female crocodile hauls herself up onto land and chooses uh, an appropriate uh, nesting site in some nice soft sand. And she'll dig down about 60 centimeters, so around two foot, and deposit anywhere between 10 and probably as many as 80 eggs for a really big individual. And the eggs in incubate for 60 to 90 days. And as mentioned in previous shows, uh, they are temperature sex dependent as well, which means the temperature of incubation within a range, a fairly fragile range of a couple of degrees, actually determines uh, whether or not those eggs will emerge, those little hatchlings will emerge as uh, male or female. In the case of crocodiles, I, uh, if memory serves, higher temperatures are male and uh, lower temperatures are female. 
and the opposite is true in uh, turtles and tortoises. Yeah, the concept being that uh, that crocodile is going to lay eggs in layers, so she's obviously not um, not laying them all flat. So uh, there is a bit of a thermal gradient in the nest. So obviously the um, the eggs lowest in the soil, furthest away from sort of exposure to the sun's heat, will be coolest. And kind of the top half, if she's constructed the nest nicely, it will be quite a bit warmer. So hopefully, in theory. You get a nice, um, a nice spread, sort of a 50-50 split of uh, of the offspring in terms of uh, what gender they're going to emerge as. Isn't nature amazing? But all right, I think in the interest of uh, keeping things moving and uh, letting. A sleeping crocodile lie. Let's uh, head over to Tembi to see what's happening. So back over at Tembi now um, at a reserve very very close to the kind of southernmost boundary with uh, Mozambique in uh, the KwaZulu Natal province of South Africa on our east coast. And we are chock a block with elephants. Isn't that marvelous? Looks like a couple of plain zebra in the back as well. But a really wonderful mix of Ellie's today. A couple of very big bulls. I did think that one or two of those might be cows. I wonder if this is not uh, all bachelors again. We'll see as they do a bit of moving. So generally, visually trying to uh, sex elephants can be a little bit tricky. Uh, the general rule is that if you take a look at uh, their forehead, viewed from, viewed from the side, the forehead of a bull is very angular, and uh, the forehead of a cow, or rather, rather the opposite. The forehead of a bull is very large, broad, and rounded. The forehead of a cow is sharp, bony, and angular. But there's a bit of variation. I've uh, seen a couple of cows with quite round foreheads and a couple of fairly bony looking bulls. But uh, checking them out as uh, they kind of spread out here, yeah, they all look male to me. Yeah, in terms of the bulls, it can be a bit tricky because uh, most of the genitalia is fairly internal. So you don't always get um, get a very very clear idea and as we know the bulls also get quite a bit bigger and males probably max out at somewhere between six and as much as eight tons uh, females probably not more than about four tons yeah the two kind of center screen here have both got radio collars it's interesting, one of them does appear to have uh, quite well developed um, breasts between her front legs. I think that's a female. But uh, yeah, weird to have one single cow uh, mixed in with all these bulls. And it is a cow. Yeah, normally, uh, normally we would expect to find um, females in uh, breeding groups. So I wonder what's going on here. Uh, perhaps this female is ovulating and feeling the need to sort of meet up with a bull to have her eggs fertilized. A bit of chaos going on in the back there with those zebra thundering around. I don't think that's due to a predator. I think they're just uh, frolicking. <laughs> Certainly very exciting for these Ellie's. We seem to be chasing them all over the place. How cool is that? There's also a water that's completely caught up in the middle of all this. And again, I can't, um, I can't hear anything from this location, but you must be getting lots of trumpeting. Ellie's get very vocal when they are excited. 
That is some awesome elephant behavior. Rita says, uh, laugh out loud, Ellie's are such bullies. So certainly, Rita, they uh, can be quite cheeky. Pick on someone your own size. Yeah, without a doubt, that one with its bottom pointed towards us is uh, an adult female. Uh, quite a bit of this behavior, kind of getting touchy-feely, very flirty with these bulls. Tells me she's uh, possibly an estrus cow. I reckon her family must be somewhere, uh, somewhere reasonably close, somewhere within earshot. Under any normal circumstances, you won't, uh, won't see a female on her own. Unless she's very, very sick or something like that, and this cow isn't. <laughs> some, uh, some aggression towards those zebra and warthogs still going on in the background there. I think just for the fun of it, because they can. It's funny, we seem to see cases of, uh, um, I've, I've always called it short man syndrome, in uh, kind of smaller elephants, uh, particularly sub-adult elephant bulls. And they don't really have the confidence that seems to come with, uh, with adult size in, in male elephants. Uh, confidence and calm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, these younger bulls can be very, very cheeky often taking out their um, uh, their booming testosterone levels in this sort of uh, rowdy behavior. Kenneth Gamble, hello sir. Uh, Kenneth says that was very, very funny. It was. Uh, spending time in nature, we often have um, often have some good laughs watching animal behavior. Some things, uh, some things can be difficult to explain. A lot of it is just just silly for the sake of being silly sometimes. Tina Skilton, who I believe is a new member. Welcome, Tina. Uh, wonderful to have you joining us. And thanks for taking the time to submit a comment. Uh, Tina says she wouldn't want to stumble across these three. <laughs> Certainly, you've got to, um, got to be a bit careful with Ellie's. They can be cheeky. But um, I've spent quite a bit of time on foot with, with elephants, occasionally in very close proximity. And if done properly, and uh, safely, it can actually be a, a wonderful experience. But as I say, it has to be has to be done quite safely. Uh, elephants have the potential to be extremely dangerous, in particular the females. Uh, perhaps a bit contrary to what you what you may think, um, the bulls are often pretty relaxed and quite approachable, provided they're uh, not breeding, not in a must cycle. But cows, oh, yeah get a bit too close to a breeding herd of elephants and, uh, and elephant cows uh, would make you wish uh, you were in a different country. Uh, certainly I've heard lots of accounts of elephant cows uh, just refusing to leave people alone on, uh, on walks, um, often following uh, groups of uh, people on walking safaris for miles as the walkers try and get out of the way of them. That can be pretty relentless. Uh, Joan Mello says uh, she's never seen Ellie's mate. Must be interesting. 
Uh, Joan, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, in 12 years of guiding, I've only been lucky enough to see it a single time. Uh, once, something like 12 years ago, uh, 11 or 12 odd years ago. It is definitely very, very interesting. Yeah, and uh, certainly seeing a, a big six or seven ton bull up on his hind legs trying to mount a cow, it's not often you see an elephant doing something as precarious as that. So it's uh, yeah, pretty, pretty unusual. Uh, Yvonne asks, uh, which animal took you a while to warm up to? Yvonne, I'm going to have to give that a bit of a thought. Maybe like rodents. I've never been a huge fan of uh, rats and mice and still, I still to tell you the truth, probably not so much. <laughs> but, um, but pretty much everything else I find uh, pretty interesting. I like the spiders and the frogs and certainly snakes, scorpions, all the weird creepy stuff that people usually aren't drawn to. That tends to be my bread and butter. I like that stuff. But yeah, a scurrying uh, rat or a mouse certainly in uh, close proximity to me, not, uh, not my favorite. But yeah, as I've said so many times before on these Live at the Waterhole shows, there is value and, if I may say, uh, beauty in every living thing. If you're willing to take um, possibly the fear or a, a bit of a threat of danger out of it, and basically every natural thing can be, uh, can be interesting. And I think as, uh, as small children, we're perhaps more tuned into it. Uh, you take a small child out into the garden and show them a, a slug or a snail or a, a grasshopper moving around in amongst the plants. And uh, you have a, a little person that is instantly fascinated. It's just tragic that uh, so many people lose that wonder for the natural world. Uh, yeah, I think we should be encouraging encouraging the kids to be outside more and more. I certainly spent most of my childhood uh, running around outside catching snakes, looking for chameleons, that sort of thing.
Now, you may have noticed at least two of the individual elephants that we've been looking at um, have been fitted with radio telemetry collars. Uh, certainly, the, um, uh, the large individual far off on the right-hand side of the screen there. See that kind of bump between the shoulder blades just at the back of the skull there? And that is the um, telemetry unit itself. So these radio collars are uh, occasionally fitted in our wilderness areas as a tool for monitoring these animals. Uh, elephants, as we know, cover vast distances in their movements annually, occasionally even uh, leaving the safety of these reserves and going as far as uh, to cross borders. I'm not aware of uh, whether or not these particular elephants do cross into uh, Mozambique to the north, but it's certainly possible. And uh, yeah, it ser serves us very well to keep an eye on them, make sure they're not going into rural communities raiding crops. And uh, if they are starting to head that way, it gives uh, the elephant management teams a chance to uh, warn people and uh, perhaps put something in place to uh, prevent that. Now we've got a few more cows emerging on the scene. Uh, these two in the frame, uh, without a doubt, are females. Some beautiful long skinny tusks on, uh, on the third cow, which has just emerged there. Again, Tembi is renowned as an area of, uh, of pretty phenomenal elephant genetics. Historically, a number of absolutely immense bulls have uh, have kind of developed in this area. A contributing factor is probably the uh, vegetation and the quality of the rainfall that does tend to fall in this area, but a large amount of it comes down to that elephant's genes. If it holds the rare recessive gene for immense tusks, and it's given everything it needs, it could develop a set of tusks that uh, that grows throughout the 40 or 50 years of its life uh, to a point where they almost drag on the ground as it moves. Now there aren't too many of uh, many of those elephants around. There's sort of a sprinkling of them across Africa, probably uh, less than 50. But we are uh, lucky to catch glimpses of them occasionally. We've been fortunate to see uh, the magnificent one ton at Old Donyo a number of times. I've seen a couple of those big bulls in uh, parts of the Kruger and um, and even viewing Ezelwini with uh, with wild earth a couple of times um, in the greater Kruger. And now the future of those bulls is uh, by no means secure. The demand for ivory um, on the rise and uh, certainly elephant poaching in some parts of Africa absolutely um, out of control uh, we have a huge responsibility to keep uh, keep those big tuskers but all of our elephants as a whole uh, nice and safe yeah essentially the um, the justification behind the taking of those tusks is not even medicinal um, all people want them for is for carving to carve them into really foolish uh, really foolish trinkets and um, chopsticks and bangles and all sorts of silly things. And when you think of the of the cost socially of uh, having an elephant shot in one of these groups by a poacher, it's an absolutely devastating loss to the rest of the family, and you lose all of the knowledge that that elephant carried in its body, which it was passing down to younger individuals in the group. And uh, I think it's a loss to, to humanity. It's a loss to all of us. You can do your bit to prevent poaching in Africa and uh, certainly to fight against it. 
simply by um, avoiding the purchasing of any ivory items in your travels. If you do end up in a place like China or Vietnam and you come across them, uh, they are beautifully carved and uh, certainly the people selling them may tell you that uh, they were taken from tusks dropped onto the ground, but uh, the truth of the matter is a very different story. If the buying stops, the killing can too. And uh, certainly the only thing out there that needs an elephant tusk is an elephant. Uh, thankfully, Africa's wild spaces are home to something like 350,000 elephants. So that is a very sustainable population. There's a huge hope for the future uh, for that population to grow. But um, it does require some, some conservation and for people to come together and change their ways and, uh, yeah, as I say, stop, stop buying ivory. In two magical African wilderness areas, the Masai Mara in Kenya and the Great Kuga National Park in South Africa, five expert safari guides follow a cast of compelling animal characters and the never-ending stories that define their lives. The Cat Report documents real stories of real predators, as witnessed and captured by a band of obsessive wildlife filmmakers. <laughs> And uh, following a successful, a successful coupling, uh, the activity of mating uh, then begins the longest gestation period of uh, any mammal uh, to walk on land on Earth at uh, 22 months, so nearly two years. And uh, following which um, a calf between 50 and 100 kilograms is born. And uh, should that calf be born female, it is the beginning of a lifelong relationship between mother and daughter uh, that could play out until the adult cow's death in her late 50s. So in some cases, moms and daughters could be together for 30, 40 years at a time. And that is a seriously, seriously long lasting and very close, for, uh, close bond, close relationship.
So certainly a very complex social structure for elephants with uh, long lasting relationships and um, yeah, certainly this, um, this long running theme that uh, their bonds last for decades. So with all of that in mind, I urge you to look at uh, elephants kept in places like Europe and North America um, in captive conditions and in particular elephants kept solitarily, elephants kept on their own. Um, I urge you to look at those sort of situations through different lenses. Now, those are not happy animals at all. Um, anyway, I think it's time now to check out a clip. Um, something quite exciting happening on the Olifants River during the night. <laughs> check it out. So uh, a little nighttime swim on Olifants West Game Reserve, one of uh, Afrikan's other fields, showing that um, yeah, elephants don't do a whole lot of sleeping through the night. When it's nice and warm in the summer, we do, we do tend to see them coming down to rivers and dams for a swim and certainly continuing that uh, relentless pursuit of food. And while the Olifants River is the home of the Nile crocodile, now these guys are not in too much in too much danger of attacks from crocs. But they are occasionally grabbed um, on the tips of their trunks by crocodiles. Thought that might be one passing behind. <laughs> it's just a just a log, a logodile. And yeah, so they yeah they can they can occasionally be grabbed on their trunks, but I've never ever heard of an adult elephant being pulled into the water by a croc. They're just too big, too strong. <laughs> very, very nice. But uh, back here at Tembi now, uh, things are ongoing around the mud wallow. Uh, conditions are quite hot and humid here in Tembi today. So, uh, yeah, all the more reason to have a bit of a splash of nice cooling mud. Um, elephants obviously have a very, very wrinkly skin which is reckoned to be something like 60% more effective in uh, trapping moisture, retaining it, and reducing the effects of evaporation. And that, uh, that all vastly increases their efficiency in terms of keeping cool when things are hot. And once again, they don't produce any sweat, so they have to have the ability to do this. Kenneth Gamble says, Isilo, the tusker who lived in Tembi, was a magnificent animal. Kenneth, I know exactly who you are talking about. Now, for anybody who doesn't know uh, Isilo, I-S-I-L-O, um, the elephant bull is certainly worth a Google. Uh, I was chatting about um, these elephant super tuskers that occasionally emerge in Tembi. Isilo was uh, the king of these, of these super tuskers in Kazadeh. Uh, yeah, he's certainly worth a Google, worth a look. A one-of-a-kind animal. I think, uh, unfortunately, now he uh, he has passed away. But he lived a long, very full, very healthy life. And uh, without a doubt, fathered countless elephant calves in this area. So hopefully, with any luck, his genetic material lives on. He left behind a living legacy. Uh, Moonbeam Smith. Um, has asked how often do they actually locate the collared ellies per day per week um, Moonbeam I think it um, it varies you probably find um, the elephants are under quite a regular surveillance 
and occasionally these collared individuals can be slightly problematic individuals. So they're Ellie's that are um, sort of more regularly, uh, regularly encountered uh, leaving parks and um, and such. Uh, but yeah, otherwise it's uh, it's based on on sort of the needs of the scientists that are keeping track of them. If they need to find these Ellie's, if they haven't been spotted in a couple of days, they can climb in a, a light aircraft, a helicopter, and do a bit of flying over these wilderness areas with a telemetry set, and they can be tracked down. It's pretty ancient technology, that uh, radio telemetry. I think it, uh, it dates back from as, as early as the, the 40s or even earlier. So I've used those telemetry sets a couple of times from a light plane trying to track um, track lines. The, the tech is very fiddly though. I think um, it's being replaced with uh, GPS equipment in some of the reserves. And that's a bit more reliable, a bit easier to use, certainly a lot less fiddly. Yeah, quite a few fairly amorous looking bulls in this area, without a doubt being drawn in by one of these females. But um, their presence is not necessarily a guarantee of getting the opportunity to mate with that cow. And the cows, after all, are, are notoriously fussy when it comes to uh, picking a mate, as they should be. Cows tend to, uh, and tend to only uh, mate with bulls or allow bulls to sire offspring and uh, when those bulls are the very biggest and most dominant uh, in the in the entire ecosystem so yeah it can certainly be quite tough for a lot of these younger bulls they're, they're looking at about 20 or 30 years after puberty before um, females will even look at them so hence quite a bit of frustration and occasionally they take it out on uh, the zebra, the impala, and the warthogs that are around. Tina Skilton says, mud pack, great for the wrinkles. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Timothy, Tina. an African spa treatment so um, if you viewed an elephant up close you probably wouldn't be advocating for uh, a mud pack's great effective qualities <laughs> yeah they are certainly very very wrinkly wrinkly beasts There is so much water around here at Tembe. The rains have been great this year. Now the same can't be said for all of our locations. A couple of uh, Wild Earth and Africam's feeds are looking quite dry. And uh, yeah, El Nino kind of shifting into La Nina is a big problem for the Southern Hemisphere this season. The rain overall has been quite disappointing. Uh, we do seem long term to be gripped by these cycles of wet and dry. We had three or four almost uh, flood riddled years and then almost no rainfall at all in some places. But uh, nature to some degree does seem to be a self-regulating system. So uh, I guess there are benefits even in the hard times. The situation only gets really critical if um, animals are completely fenced in, uh, perhaps on a, a much smaller privately owned reserve, 
know, where they don't have the ability to move to uh, greener pastures, so to speak, areas with more food, more water, and in effect a migration, and then you have animals starving and really starting to suffer. Um, at that point, it's the responsibility of the reserve or the property owner to start providing, often at uh, immense expense, devastating expense. If you think an elephant is eating something like a, a quarter ton over 500 pounds of food a day, it can be very, very uh, difficult to have those needs met, especially when you're talking about uh, possibly dozens or hundreds of elephants at a time. All the more reason to have these reserves large and uh, protected in their entirety. Uh, give the animals the means to, uh, to, find, to find those resources, have all of their needs met uh, in times of uh, sort of easy going as well as times of drought. Alrighty, I think uh, let's keep things moving now that our Ellie's are drifting off out of sight there. Let's head to Vic Falls once again. So back up at Victoria Falls, we're at a slightly different, um, slightly different AfriCam camera feed and not the Vulture uh, restaurant itself. But we are looking at uh, a number of vultures and a marabou stork. Almost certainly individuals that would have attended that, um, that breakfast service that was provided for them. Um, again, in an earlier segment, I uh, mentioned that uh, vultures and other kind of scavenging birds, uh, once they have had a good feed, will often come down to the water, have a bit of a splash, do some preening, some grooming of their feathers, and uh, have a much needed drink. I think that's what's gone on here today. So yeah, somewhat uh, cleaner than you might think. Uh, that can't always be said for uh, the marabou stork, uh, which is actually quite famous for um, uh, urinating and defecating on its own legs and feet. Now we're not 100% sure why they do that, but occasionally their legs and feet are stained white by the uric acid in their excrement. And the thoughts are that uh, possibly uh, the acids in that uh, urea help to kill uh, bacteria, which would obviously be very useful as they're wandering around, um, around and in amongst uh, the bodies of dead, rotting animal carcasses. That's a very good view of a, of a marabou there. Quite scruffy looking things. But yeah, once again, beauty is all in the eye of the beholder and it's not always um, all about looks. They serve an extremely vital function in cleaning up a dead, decaying animal material and uh, quite literally, directly, preventing the spread of disease. Uh, Tracy, hello. Uh, Tracy asks, do I keep a bird list? Uh, Tracy, when I was guiding full time, I did uh, did keep a bird list, but um, I've kind of let it slide. Um, while I understand a lot of the twitchers or the people that are very, very keen bird watchers do, um, it's never really been a, a huge, um, huge focus in my time in the bush, uh, to be honest. I do like the birds, I do find them very interesting, but um, yeah, I, I guess uh, as an individual I just don't have the, the drive to see um, thousands and thousands of different species, I will certainly to keep track. 
And interest in birds is a very, very valuable quality, though, if you uh, find yourself spending time out in the bush and the presence of uh, mammals, um, the high profile species is not always guaranteed. Very impressive wingspan on that marabou. So yeah, if uh, you can find interest in something like birds or reptiles or frogs or uh, butterflies, I like the butterflies a lot, your time in nature will always be, uh, be full. Full and interesting. And uh, we do like to keep these safaris as, and uh, even these uh, Live at the Waterhole shows as holistic as possible. Try and get a bit of a look at everything. Uh, I find it all pretty fascinating. Not all about predators, even though we do like them. It might seem a bit peculiar that these vultures are all just uh, hanging around and seemingly not really doing anything on the on the ground in the shade. But if you uh, if you think about it, it's uh, quite costly in terms of uh, spending energy uh, to just sort of fly around the entire time. Uh, vultures are remarkably efficient when it comes to to gliding around and uh, using as little of their energy reserves to achieve that movement as possible uh, but still it, it costs so when given the opportunity in particular on a hot day it's uh, probably quite um, quite intelligent to sit in the shade We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content. Now, um, marabou, marabou storks, rather, um, are not migratory birds at all. Um, they are permanent residents out here in Africa. Oh, some helmeted guinea fowl crossing there. Um, so they are permanent residents throughout the year uh, here in Africa. 
I think their movements are far more controlled by the availability of food. Uh, so obviously they will fly quite vast distances, but um, it's not to do with following the seasons. It's interesting though that um, the concept of bird migrations, which um, is only a scientific idea, probably about 150 years old, actually originated from storks. Uh, more specifically, the European white stork, which is uh, a summer visitor to much of Southern Africa. We see them in parts of Zimbabwe, Botswana, Mozambique, South Africa, and they make an epic trek um, as the seasons shift from as far south as South Africa to as far north in the Northern Hemisphere as places like, um, like Belgium, uh, Germany, and uh, even Holland, where I've seen them. But um, as little as 150 years ago, the top birding experts in the world, um, when questioned as, uh, as to where the birds disappeared to when winter fell in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, believed such peculiar things as, um, as birds must be going into the sea. Uh, seriously, 100, only 150 years ago, the top scientists in the world uh, thought that all the swallows were diving into the ocean um, and returning when spring came in Europe once again. It was only when a, um, a stork was discovered arriving back in Germany with an African arrow through its breast obviously fired at that bird by um, some sort of African tribe uh, somewhere in North Africa. And that bird had made something like a 5,000 kilometer migration with, um, with a three or four foot arrow and, um, and spear through its body. And that bird, it's actually worth a Google. So a uh, Google stalk with an arrow through it. Um, I believe it's been taxidermied. It's in uh, some sort of museum somewhere there in uh, in Europe and it was from that that scientists were sort of encouraged to change their views somewhat and investigate the possibility that birds were um, sensitive to the seasons and capable of flying across the world in search of better conditions now we live and we learn I wonder how much of uh, what we think we know now uh, will be changed as uh, science improves into the next century. Obviously many of us will not be around to, um, uh, to learn about those discoveries, but uh, yeah, hopefully we will learn and uh, learn things as science improves. Again, things looking pretty dusty and dry um, here in the, um, the northern part of uh, Zimbabwe, up at Victoria Falls. So while the east coast of Africa, certainly Mozambique, uh, KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa have had good rainfall, uh, much of central, western and, um, and the northern parts of uh, the southern half of the continent have been bitterly disappointed. Thank goodness for a couple of these uh, artificial, artificially provided water holes. They are a lifesaver. Plate Smasher says that sounds like the most uncomfortable flight in history. Plate Smasher, can you imagine? Um, yeah. Now, once again, though, a testament to the, the resilience of wild things, the ability to overcome impediments and uh, pain and suffering and to just carry on. Talk about a drive to survive.
quite a few more of these vultures coming in. I wonder if uh, we might see a little bit of a little bit of bathing. Uh, also, uh, perhaps most of them taking off. Oh, certainly this landscape looks quite leafy uh, with the predominance of uh, Mapani woodland. Mapani, uh, um, a species of tree well adapted to uh, these dry conditions. So it might uh, look quite, um, quite appetizing for a vegetarian animal, uh, for some of our herbivores. But um, in truth, there is not a whole lot that can actually feed on these trees. Uh, elephants do. But I believe the, uh, the nutritive value of uh, Mapani leaves and twigs is very, very low. So uh, certainly tough, tough times and tough conditions coming into uh, the dry season, which we're about to encounter for our herbivores. I'm sure it'll be a time where our carnivores, our lions, leopards, hyenas, wild dogs, etc., uh, will cash in. There'll be lots of. Uh, Lots of weak herbivores this dry season. Cass Pinnock, yeah, nice to hear from you and thanks for your um, thanks for your comment. And nice to uh, yeah chat a little bit more about um, natural history as well. And the natural world is, for me at least, an en endless source of uh, entertainment. Uh, Joan Mellow says, I have never seen so many vultures at a watering hole before. Yeah, it is uh, great to see them in these, uh, in these big concentrations, Joan. I think, again, that, um, that stems from the proximity of that vulture restaurant. There are loads of vultures in this area. Uh, this whole Victoria Falls area is quite amazing. Um, even Vic Falls town um, in, uh, in Zimbabwe has um, elephants fairly regularly walking down the streets. Um, I've heard uh, frequent reports of lions and leopards passing through. Certainly the odd buffalo here or there. So it is a wild, wild place. And a bit of a tourism hub. Um, a visit to Victoria Falls is one of those bucket list trips. Got to do it once.
and that um, fairly dark bird walking across the um, the open area there is one lone helmeted guinea fowl a kind of a game bird species a little bit like uh, uh, some of the pheasants you might find in parts of the northern hemisphere uh, usually flocking birds so you'd expect to see them um, with some others Uh, Joan Mello says uh, she would love to see the falls. It must be beautiful. Uh, Joan, it absolutely is. Yeah, uh, yeah, I hope you have the opportunity at some stage to get up there. It is beautiful. Um, now these guinea fowl are very much now these guinea fowl are very much um, a species of game bird so in some places they are hunted for their meat uh, but my late grandfather once uh, once said to me now the best way to prepare a, a guinea fowl that you've cooked is to um, take a large clay brick place it in the bottom of a sort of a large cooking pot especially if you're out uh, out in nature maybe camping uh, place the the plucked bird on top of that brick. Uh, put a bit of water up to the surface level of that brick. Uh, chop up some root vegetables, some nice carrots, potatoes, um, tunips, that sort of thing, or rather, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, place them sort of up to the top level of the bird. Uh, cook in the uh, in the open fire until the bird is uh, lovely and golden brown. And then uh, chuck the guinea fowl out and uh, chomp onto the brick because it's going to be more tender than uh, than a wild guinea. So uh, perhaps we just stick to um, stick to domestic chickens. <laughs> but in the interest of keeping things moving, I think uh, let's head over to Stony Point to see what's happening along South Africa's coast. very very nice so a couple of rock hyraxes doing a bit of basking in the sun here now these are a, a little species of mammal that we don't get to spend um, all that much time with um, under many normal circumstances across um, our other feeds they're very very specialized in terms of uh, the kind of conditions and the terrain they actually need and in which to survive totally at home amongst these rocks and they are herbivores, so they, um, they kind of browse and graze as they move. But uh, they have to have uh, these rocky recesses um, in which to bolt for survival. Uh, some of their biggest predators, uh, certainly in this cap region, are the eagles. Uh, the black eagle uh, lives off of an almost hyrax exclusive diet. Um, and they will also be caught by... Uh, Cape's resident population of caracals, some of which get enormous down there, and uh, even the Cape leopard, which is also a dusky specialist. Quite a nice opportunity to have a look at um, this little rock hyrax's back feet, and that leads to quite an incredible fact about their biology and certainly their uh, natural history. Such odd little animals. And the closest relative in the wild for the rock hyrax, after all, is the African elephant. How bizarre is that? You'd be forgiven for thinking they're um, like a f little furry rodent or something like that. They're only tiny, uh, five or six kgs in weight. Uh, but it is, in fact, the African elephant. And the secret lies in those feet. And if you x ray a rock hyrax's um, 
front and rear foot. They have the same number of toes as the African elephant. They also have a set of tusks in the upper jaw, lateral incisors, and a very similar stomach system. There we are, but uh, you would be forgiven, as I say, for thinking it would be any other species on the planet. A plate Smasher asks, have the great white sharks returned? Um, now, for anybody who doesn't know what uh, Plate Smasher is asking about, uh, we had a situation along South Africa's coastline, uh, the south coast, where um, uh, historically, I mean, this, this entire area has been a phenomenal habitat for great whites. Uh, some of the um, healthiest densities of great white sharks on Earth can be found here. But uh, we had a number of orcas, uh, killer whales, that took up residence here for a while and absolutely decimated the great white uh, population. They're literally killing these apex predators, these immense sharks. Um, and I think the belief was that the great, uh, great or rather the uh, killer whales, the orcas, uh, were eating uh, some of the internal organs and then just leaving these carcasses. But um, I believe the killer whales or the orcas have moved on, and I think those great whites are uh, starting to return to that smasher. Yeah, crazy stuff. Now, while these rock hyraxes um, don't exactly have the same foot structure as the elephant in terms of uh, kind of a lack of externally visible toes or a big flat foot pad uh, for life in the savannas, these guys are highly evolved uh, to scurry among the rocks. And they've got very, very grippy toe pads, a bit like um, a bit like the soles on like a sporty pair of uh, trainers. Uh, not a whole lot of jumping going on today. These guys are just enjoying uh, some very welcome sunshine down in the Cape. Uh, right next to this very chilly ocean, uh, the winds can be vicious, very cold temperatures, drizzly conditions for ages, and uh, certainly the nights can be bitterly cold. Uh, before I was born, my uh, late grandmother um, actually hand-raised one of these little rock hyraxes. I'm not 100% um, sure how she, um, how she came to possess this little orphan hyrax, but uh, she was an extremely kind and gentle woman, so I'm sure um, she empathized with him. And anyway, she raised this little thing. But um, a fact of rock hyrax uh, behavior and biology is that they always visit the bathroom in the same place. So when it came to uh, potty training this little hyrax and keeping the house clean, uh, she managed to get him to um, go to the bathroom um, on sort of a folded up piece of paper towel in a saucer, uh, which was obviously placed for him on the ground. And then she could quite conveniently go to the bathroom, tip all of his leavings into the toilet and uh, flush it all away uh, quite conveniently. But um, anyway, this little rock hyrax um, eventually cut out the middleman, and I think um, I think the scent of his urine, uh, put probably a very little fine residue, in the bathroom, uh, drew him drew him in there, and uh, for quite a while, and um, he actually learned to sit on the toilet seat and kind of do his business, um, right there, which was pretty convenient and pretty amazing. 
But then, unfortunately, um, a time came where my gran was away, and this poor little Hyrax fell into the toilet, and uh, that was the end of the story. So, uh, yeah, perhaps, uh, perhaps they're not as evolved for um, a life in a captive or a human environment after all. Lots of hazards when you are so small and you have no ability to swim. And they certainly do seem to be driven or, or rather drawn to um, human constructions and human uh, habitation in particular around this Cape region. Um, we have problems every single year when people come down from uh, from places as far away as um, as Johannesburg by car. They park at these lovely tourist points along the coast here in the Cape and uh, Hyraxes in an attempt to get out of the wind. I climb into the undercarriage of that vehicle, climb up into the body, into the chassis, and then uh, people hop in their cars, drive all the way back to Johannesburg, many thousands of kilometers out of the way, arrive at home, and um, a rock hyrax jumps out in the garage. So I, I hear stories every year about um, wildlife rehabbers that have to um, sort of gather these little hyraxes up and try and return them to where they belong, down in the Cape. <laughs> That's a properly African problem. Lady Macbeth says dusty lavatories are very obvious at uh, 12 and 10 in uh, Namibia. Apologies for my pronunciation there. Um, Afrikaans is definitely um, a limited skill set for me. But uh, Lady Macbeth, I know exactly what you're talking about. In areas where these dussies or uh, rock hyraxes are very well established, uh, the streaks from their uh, urine and their droppings uh, stain the rocks. So uh, often where um, you have lovely smooth granite boulders, uh, those streaks are extremely prominent and they last for years. Always a very good visual sign at a distance of the presence of the hyraxes. Experience captivating wildlife documentaries, showcasing incredible animal behavior, for free by visiting lionmountain.tv or downloading the app, accessible on both Apple and Android platforms.
that you are. Certainly, if, um, this area is known as the Wild Coast for um, for some very good reasons. And not only is this uh, place uh, kind of filled with wild and interesting species, both um, in the ocean and on the land, but it's also battered by some pretty severe and wild weather conditions. And you can see those effects on these rocks over millions of years. And uh, even in the uh, types of plants that do occur here, uh, these fahis and, uh, and other succulents are uh, specialists for um, life in a very tough landscape. And uh, what a pleasure here with uh, Wild Earth and Africam to be uh, taking such a vast and varied look at so many different landscapes, uh, ecosystems, biomes, uh, as we kind of hop between these camera feeds. The variety is the spice of life. Alrighty, well, while this Hyrax investigates some kelp here on the beach at uh, Stony Point, let's head back up to Tembe and have a look at what's happening up there. So back up at Tembe and uh, our elephants are certainly not going anywhere. A colossal bull emerging from the vegetation far at the back and what looks like a nice mixed breeding group um, out in these wonderful grasslands at the moment. That is a big bull. That certainly could be a contender in terms of getting some mating done if one of these females is indeed in estrus, as we thought earlier. I mentioned in an earlier segment that females seem to be drawn to um, the biggest of bulls. Um, certainly, they, they do seem to choose their mates based on uh, height, bulk, the length of tusks, uh, the width of the head. Um, all apparently telltale indicators of very good, strong genes. And the, um, the fact of the matter is uh, that that kind of naturally encourages the cows uh, to gravitate towards those uh, last few super tuskers, uh, thus ensuring the, um, the continuation of those very, very special genetic lineages. Uh, long may Africa be home to living mammoths in our elephant tuskers. These early cows taking a moment to have a bit of a drink from that uh, very green looking water hole at the back. But this is just a youngster. Uh, in essence, sort of a small child, uh, somewhere around eight to ten years of age, I would estimate, and a young bull. So prepubescent. And this chap seems to have a deformed back left leg. Uh, sort of a club foot. It happens sometimes. Um, it's pretty rare for elephants to break leg bones. The legs are just so big and so bulky. Uh, but that could have been a birth defect. Doesn't seem to trouble this Ellie too much, uh, though it, um, you know, it must take some strain putting all that bulk uh, on a slightly weakened leg. Now, certainly, though, its physical condition is an indication that it is doing absolutely fine. Um, Ellie's in particular seem to be very good at um, managing with disabilities, provided they can move. Um, 
they can deal with all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. As uh, Saleli um, is asking if that um, that algae is toxic. As uh, Saleli, if you're talking about the green stuff that's floating on the water at the back there, it's not actually algae. Um, it's something called a water cabbage, which is a species of aquatic plant, unfortunately alien and very invasive, uh, which has come in from uh, from South America. Um, and yeah, at the rate it reproduces, it um, it cannot be consumed fast enough by the animals. It is palatable to some degree, I believe, but uh, it's also very fibrous. It's not too nu nutritious, so the animals don't seem to uh, love to eat it. And um, it rapidly forms a carpet across the entire water's surface, which might not seem like too much of an issue. But for the uh, functionings in that uh, that water itself, it traps uh, or prevents all of the sunlight from uh, kind of entering, which means that any aquatic plants below the surface start to die, and uh, many species below that uh, rely on uh, exposure to sunlight for their health also suffer. So it's a really really nasty stuff, and um, in many parts of South Africa, initiatives are underway to try and try and take it out of there. Obviously, it's not ideal to spray herbicides in uh, natural areas because herbicides tend to kill all the plants. And uh, definitely, we don't want chemicals going into the uh, drinking water of all the animals. Uh, Mercedes Bean uh, says, I'll bet one ton, aka Mr. Tusks, which is a, a large elephant bull that lives in the area of Old Donio, has bewitched many a cow. Uh, can't argue with that. I'm sure he's very popular with the ladies up there. And um, yeah, no problems with that. Hopefully he's producing lots of calves, uh, which will one day uh, produce tusks uh, possibly as big as his. But yeah, certainly in terms of that uh, floating, uh, that floating water cabbage, uh, something has got to be done. It's uh, it's all over the show. I believe there are um, types of insects that can be introduced, which uh, specifically parasitize that plant, and can be very effective at um, at removing it. But the problem with introducing a species into an area where it uh, doesn't belong. I think the, uh, the bugs come from somewhere else, and possibly South America as well, is that once they've successfully destroyed all of that um, uh, water cabbage, what are they supposed to eat? And then we face a problem when those bugs start destroying uh, some sort of indigenous plant. So these, uh, yeah, these bio, bio issues can be uh, a bit troubling. But ultimately, humans were the ones who who were responsible for introducing it. So um, we should be the ones to figure it out. Clean up our mess.
So it's, uh, yeah, it's very probable that this, um, this water weed or this floating water cabbage was not introduced on purpose. But unfortunately, very often when, um, uh, when boats um, are, um, are kind of moved from one water system to another, uh, they contain the spores of uh, water plants. So people who, um, who do um, take the boat or the jet skis out have got a big responsibility to make sure um, those vehicles are nice and clean uh, when they're moved big distances across the country don't want to take stuff like that and introduce it accidentally somewhere else. Looks like that enormous bull is coming this way. It doesn't have um, doesn't have a set of tusks that would uh, cause us to kind of name him a tusker, but a very impressive set of ivory nonetheless. And you can see some somewhat slightly excitable and also perhaps at the same time a nervous behavior from some of these cows around him. Uh, keeping in mind this bull is probably 40% uh, bigger than even the biggest lady um, in this herd. Uh, bulls also have a reputation for being quite boisterous. But provided he's not musty, a chap this big should be quite gentle. Hopefully he can sniff out that uh, pregnant, or rather that um, estrus cow, the cow that uh, is ovulating. And uh, the next generation of African elephants will be on the way. But unfortunately, we only have about two minutes left before uh, we wrap up live at the water hole for uh, the afternoon. And um, uh, yeah, so it is, uh, it's probably pretty much time for me to say goodbye to you. But uh, I'll be back with you uh, for another installment of live at the water hole again, uh, same time tomorrow. So uh, be sure to uh, pop on by. Uh, let's chat all things wildlife and uh, nature uh, tomorrow once again. Diane in the UK says uh, she tried to get water hyacinth to grow in her garden pond and was unsuccessful. Uh, that is rather ironic. Of course, uh, when we want it, we can't, uh, can't have it. And when we don't want it, it's a plague. <laughs> Spas, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, always great to spend it with uh, so many of you Wild Earth viewers. And uh, definitely until next time. But um, from myself, uh, the naturalist Liam Burrow, as well as uh, our team of directors and all of the unseen faces here at Wild Earth doing the hard work behind the scenes, uh, we'd like to say a big thank you for joining us. Have a wild day and we'll chat to you sometime soon.